All right. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to this tutorial this afternoon. Um, so I'm very glad to be here in uh, Australia to be able to give this uh, tutorial. We've put a lot of work into it, and I hope that you're, you'll find it uh, fun to do. So we call this hunting Linux malware for fun and flags. Um, because it's basically about how to find malware on a Linux server, how to uh, mitigate the uh, effects, and a few tips that we've learned over the time to uh, uh, investigate the incidents uh, on Linux servers. So, a little bit about me. So, I'm going to be uh, really quick. I'm a malware researcher at ESET. We do. We have an office in Montreal. We're about eight. Researchers, we do long term research, so we take a particular threat and we try to understand it as much as possible. Uh, if, it, if it's possible, uh, implement trackers to be able to um, have as much information as possible about it, updates, um, um, population, things like that. Um, outside work, I am also a um, challenge designer for the NordSec CTF competition, one of the largest on site CTF competition that sailed in Montreal for three years now. We prepended a conference um, last year, and it's, it's growing. The event is growing. We even have um, training, conference, and CTF competition um, this year. I'm also a um, co-organizer of uh, Montreal, which is a monthly event where we gather together, we um, invite uh, new people to um, um, see what um, uh, CTF challenges look like. So basically, we have we have a challenge each month. Um, during two hours, everyone works and help each other. And at the at the end, uh, someone presents the solution. So our schedules for today is quite uh, tight because I have a lot of uh, material. Well, I have a presentation and. You will have a lot of work to do, hopefully. <laughs> um, so I will take about five or 10 minutes just to explain what the network setup will look like. Um, and then I'll, I'll give a, a presentation about um, more generic tips about how to find malware on servers. And I will present a solution so you'll have access to two different compromised server. And I'll uh, give the solutions to each of them and I'll try to be as fast as possible to make it like 25 minutes each. We'll, we'll see how it goes. And I've, I have a 10 minute buffer for questions, et cetera. So I usually do the presentation first, but due to time restraint, I'm giving you, um, so I hope it's gonna hold the load because we are a lot of people. So the first version of this tutorial was, uh, for about 20 people, and I hopefully was able to scale it so that everyone can uh, uh, have access quite fast. And the URL, if you cannot see it, is malware.doesnot.win. So if it does not respond now, maybe wait a few seconds, and it should come up. <clears throat> so basically, uh, when you go to that URL, you will have the possibility to create your own infrastructure. So each and every one of you have um, uh, root access to the two compromised servers, and you can um, um, investigate the, uh, the malware that's been installed on, on this machine. Um, you will need OpenVPN open VPN to connect to this, um, your small internet. And you can basically do whatever you want with it. You, you can install whatever package you want, your root on the machine, and you are the only one on it. Oh, um, yeah, and try not to break it, because you're all on different physical machines, but you have other people on it. So if you like port scan or whatever, it's, it's just gonna slow down the process and it's gonna be less enjoyable for the others. Does that work so far? Yeah, okay. 
I'll try to monitor the load at the same time. All right. <clears throat> so I don't know if you're familiar with CTF competition. It's a, um, a thing in the security industry where uh, we have not necessarily compromise, but um, competition where you need to find flags in order to win. So today, this is, is not a competition. However, I did hide flags all over the, the place to um, give you hints that you're in the right direction. Um, I think there's about 15 of them, like one has seven, I think, the other has eight, something like that. And they are always related to the malware that's installed on the machine. So it's not like random, randomly placed. So basically when you achieve like decrypting something or start understanding something, you, you will probably find a flag um, on that. And yeah, they usually, so basically a flag is just a string of text. I didn't describe it, but yeah, string of text. And I usually use the format flag with um, the symbol that I'm not sure how to uh, say in English. <laughs> So yeah, this is meant to be fun and learn. And um, so don't hesitate to um, ask me later after I've done my presentation or uh, someone next to you to help you with, with it. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I've, I've put it at the end. So once you're connected to, to the OpenVPN, so the, the two servers are, um, uh, server1.flags.win and server2.flags.win. So you connect over SSH, the root password is training. I think I, I've put it on the, the, the page if I remember, but just in case. So yeah, you, there's a little um, um, situation for the, each of them. So the first one is you are a um, hosting company and you receive an email about, um, about your server sending way too much spam. So he's planning to cut your internet connection, so your job is to find out what, what's going on. So just to give you an idea about what you can find, um, the source of the spam, where does it come from? Um, if you can find the cause, I was, it was installed in the first place. Um, the, you'll see the different IP address. There's someone installing it. There's a CNC server. There's, there's something going on. Um, I've written flags next to it, but it's, it's not real. So they, they, there are flags, but not with the IP address. I removed that. Um, what's the content of the spam? Or the things that are interesting for us? And understand how the malware actually works and if you've cleaned yourself successfully. So, those situations are, are, are actually uh, real. So we have taken real malware that we have analyzed before and uh, modified them to uh, work in a sandbox environment. And um, uh, so this is not like a, something we wrote uh, that, that's completely out of the, uh, of the picture. But um, yeah, so have fun. So basically, you can continue to work on it. Th does it work for most of you guys or and girls? Yeah. It works. <laughs> like, um, the, the, just a little story. The first time we did this, um, the, the, the server just completely crashed, and we were two, so someone could fill up while I was doing the debugging and rebooting of the the machine. 
But today I'm alone, so I was like, I hope that it's going to work because <laughs> I don't have a backup. <laughs> so, yeah, I have um, about an half hour presentation about um, um, general tips and um, why we decided to do this presentation. So basically, um, we, we presented on, um, so last year, my, my, um, my colleague and friend, uh, Olivier, presented here at, at LCA, but we were uh, mostly doing like a, um, um, a summary of what, what, we, what we find in the wild, what we analyze the, the numbers, um, and we wanted to help a little bit more sysadmins and the, the community to uh, be better at finding the malware. Um, we, it, it happened a lot of time in the past that we um, um, contacted people who were compromised, and the answer back was, uh, so we, and we gave them like specific things. For example, your uh, server is um, reverse proxying through this port, uh, and I don't know where, uh, but you should clean yourself up, or your machine is send sending spam, or your machine is compromised with this uh, open SSH backdoor. And it, it came too often that uh, the answer was like, oh, I just checked my server and I'm, I'm not compromised. So they basically didn't find what, what was wrong with, with, with their server, and we thought, well, is it, is, is it because they're, they're not good enough? Is it because um, they, there's not enough education? So we decided to build the, this training to help the community. So why do people write malware on Linux? Um, so it's, it's mostly about server-side malware. Um, we have seen uh, desktop malware uh, on Linux too, but really in the past few years, this is what we've seen the most is uh, criminals compromising servers to um, use their the resources that they have. So to have, uh, it's, it's different than the Windows desktop uh, type in the sense that servers have a lot of bandwidth. Um, they also have a very high uptime so it, it makes them good candidate for um, sending spam or uh, setting up reverse proxies for their infrastructure, for their Windows uh, malware. Also, if, we, if you compromise a server with a lot of web traffic, um, you can redirect a little amount of that traffic and gain money out of it. That's another way. And you can, you can host all sorts of service, whether it's DNS server or reverse proxies or web pages for uh, phishing or whatnot. Now, why should we care about this malware? Why should we try to understand it instead of just killing it? Um, so the, the, first of all, for your server, uh, I'll, I'll I'll check in a few minutes. Just try again and <clears throat> So some people don't really care about their, the, so for example, the, the impacts of, of malware on, the, on, on Linux servers is uh, you get bad IP reputation for um, uh, sending spam, for example, and it can basically get you on block lists. Um, another reason is cyber criminals can use your server to drive a, a large amount of traffic, uh, raise bill, um, also risk for any data that's on the server, whether it's uh, personal data or passwords or credit, even credit card numbers for uh, transactional websites. So why spend some time to uh, understand them instead of, um, let's say, okay, I found it, I'm just gonna uh, kill, kill Dash 9 and I'm not gonna see it again. 
Well, it, it doesn't really work that way. Uh, if you just kill the process, it may just come back and you didn't really find the source. So if it's stolen credential, it will, the, the actors will probably just reuse these stolen credentials to get back to you. Um, again, if you don't clean everything that's in the way, it's probably gonna come back. Um, understand also what's, what was the risk of this malware. So if, if, for example, it was stealing some information from, from the server, um, it's better to know it than just uh, uh, closing your eyes and, and hear and uh, act as uh, nothing happened. And you can also uh, explain the, the, the behavior for, for the, these uh, sneaky malware. So I've split the different things that we can investigate into what I call artifacts. It's basically uh, an outline of my, uh, the rest of my presentation. So you can investigate the file system, whether it's log or if the malware is persistent, you will find it somewhere. Um, you can also in, um, investigate the memory. So if, for example, you, you have a process that started um, the, and it's not on the disk anymore, which we find very often because, uh, again, the uptime of server is really high. So the persistent is not a big issue for the, the bad guys. So in order to uh, do these kind of analysis, you can do it on user LAN or kernel LAN, whether it's the process or a kernel module. Um, and the last thing is uh, network. So everything that goes in and out of the server can be captured and analyzed. So let's start with the file system. So we are at LinuxConf. Uh, this is, you're not the target audience for this, this kind of command, but um, it's, it's in anyway. So basically ls-alt will just sort it by timestamp, so you can easily, if, if the guy didn't temper the, um, the timestamp of the files, you can easily sort what, what changed uh, recently. But uh, yeah, again, this, as I said, this can be tempered. It's not like a bulletproof solution. Um, the good guy, the, the, the bad guys that are clever uh, usually restore the timestamp back on the file. So it, it's a way, but it's not bulletproof. If you want more details about the different timestamps, you can use stats, oh, no, just, just stats, sorry, and the name of the file. If you wanna go a little further and find the, and, um, and do it on, on the whole file system, you can use find. Oh, by the way, the, the slides are in the, uh, on the website as well. So if there's something, because sometimes uh, I think the font is a little, is a little small, you can follow along on the, uh, on the, the website. So if you want to identify the files that, that are on, on the system, for example, um, to, to assess that um, bash history is a text file, for example. Um, you can use file. File is, is good to identify the different uh, files. So here we have a, a file that's called .vimInfo, but it's actually a binary, an executable binary, which is quite strange. There's also all sorts of logs you can look into. Um, there's the at log. Um, if you are hosting web pages, the HTTP log can be useful to find out um, if um, there's some query that, that's suspicious that could have triggered a, a code execution. Um, in Varla, you also have messages, syslog, and you can also use for um, OpenSSH, again, if they did not temper it, because if they have root access, they can temper all of this. Um, there's last minus E, which prints the last login the, the, on, on the system. Um, lately, we've got systemd's journal CTL, which is a, a little bit more difficult to temper. And um, 
There's also the audit D logs, which are, were quite interesting for us a few years ago. Well, they're still interesting, but um, it happened that we learned about it uh, and we actually had a good use case for it. So audit D is a uh, framework that's um, uh, part of the kernel and it, you can log uh, all sorts of events and you can even send the, the logs over the network. So if you don't want to the, the, the uh, bad guys coming in to temper it, you can have it before they can do it. So the, 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 the reason why uh, we started using it is because we got access to a machine where we knew that the the, the, it, it was compromised and we knew that the bad guy also had root access. So we were like, okay, what can we do to better understand what he's doing over his SSH session without messing around with um, too much with the rest of the system? So we used audit D and we started logging exec v call to, um, so the incantation is audit ctl dash a exit um, exit always dash s and then this is called you want so exec ve so we knew he was connecting over SSH because we, we we saw it over the network but we had no clue what what he was doing with with that session and it was quite quick like it was probably a, a script or something so what we've learned is with with uh, the audit ctl is that he was using a Perl script uh, he was piping a Perl script through the SSH session, and we could only see it little, like every time he, he was doing uh, calling external executable. So we didn't even have the logic at the time. I'll, I'll get uh, back to it later. There's also an offline file system. So all the things I've talked about so far are when you are on the remote server and you don't physically have access. But if you do have access, or you can uh, turn it off and have some kind of uh, KVM or whatever, and, and have access to the disk, you can, you can do all of this offline. And I've put up the command just to um, mount as uh, read-only the drive and, and capture it as well with DD. All right. So enough of the files, I'm gonna talk about like how to analyze a live process. So we've, we've came with a few tips um, over the time and I wanna share them with you. Um, so let's start with the easy one, uh, PS, AU, X, or with, with or without the W, will print all the processes. And then you can use stop or htop if you like enters GUIs. Um, another thing that's uh, very useful is LSOF for printing um, all the open files. Um, you can use dash N to just print the network one. And dash E, correct me if I'm wrong, but for the TCP, UDP, well, IP one. Another thing that's very useful for analyzing um, live processes is uh, procfs. There's a lot of little things in there that can actually help you uh, uh, sort out what, what the process is, is doing. So you can actually find the executable that's um, uh, being uh, launched, the main executable, using the uh, exe magical symlink, so slash proc, with the process ID and then exc. If you just um, ls uh, dash l, you will have the, the, the path of the binary that's being executed. The, the interesting thing with, this, with uh, doing this instead of just ps is that you get the actual binary but because um, you, the, the executable can replace what ps is showing. Um, and another thing about the uh, EXC magical symlink is that you can retrieve the original file even if it was deleted from the file system. 
So you can copy it. So you can um, launch a, a binary and delete it. And you can retrieve it via the exe symlink. And it, it will have the same hash. It will be exactly the same. Um, another interesting thing is the environment uh, variables. Uh, because as we've seen malware that uh, have encryption keys and environment, and environment variables. So when you have the sample alone, you cannot really analyze it because you don't have the decryption key. So uh, in this case, environment can, can be very handy. If you want to be uh, a little bit more hardcore, you can uh, core the, the memory of the process. So GCAR comes with GDB, and it can, um, um, it will capture all the non-file back uh, pages. So what it means is that it will not um, um, dump the actual executable. It will dump all the memory that's uh, like the stack and the heap that is being used. If you want the, a thorough acquisition, you want the whole thing, there's um, a thing called memfetch that lcamtoof.coredon.cx has made. It, it's quite old, and I'm, I'm not sure it, it still works. It probably still works. Uh, but that's the only thing we could find to dump the, the actual old thing. Um, but coming back to the uh, proc uh, slash pid slash exe, uh, GCore will not dump, as I said, the, the original binary, but you can retrieve it with, with, with the symlink. So if you want to debug it later or have it in a more complete uh, way, you can use both of them, and then you can analyze the, uh, the, the state of the process by using GDB with the ELF executable you've retrieved and the core dump that you've produced. Or if you just want to do it the simple way, um, you can just look if you can find some malicious strings in the, in the core dump with strings. Um, it's cheap and it's very efficient. <laughs> If you want to go even more hardcore, uh, you can analyze the kernel memory. That's useful only if you, you suspect that there's some kind of rootkit or something that the kernel module that, that's installed that's um, hiding some behavior from you. So for example, uh, uh, you can have a kernel module that will uh, uh, hide you the fact that there are files on the systems or they are, that they are process running. So, um, you can uh, capture this uh, kernel memory with Lime, and then Volatility is, uh, I think, is the tool at the moment to do the, this kind of analysis. They, um, they do have um, a few um, plugins for, uh, for the kernels. It's not as, I don't know if, it, it's been a long time since I've used it. But at the time, it was not as good as the Windows uh, version of the of Volatility, but uh, it, it's getting there. Now, the last one is network. Um, people forget that uh, if you turn off the machine, you may not get the network configuration back that was, that was there. Um, so. There are a few things that you can uh, dump, the, all the, the IP tables rules with, with IP table save. And if you have IPv6, IP6 table save. And with IP route two now, we have a lot of different uh, things we can dump, the IP rules, um, the addresses, the routes, and the tunnel. So we've seen tunnel before, uh, people doing uh, IP and IP tunnel from one compromised host to another to hide the, their tracks. And it, it was quite hard to find, actually, uh, because it, it, yes, it added an interface, but the server had like 16 interface. And uh, it, we saw that it drives a lot of traffic. We saw this IP and IP tunnel, 
And then we learned that IP route 2 can do like very easily uh, IP, to, uh, IP and IP tunnels. So here's an example of a simple reverse proxy implemented with two IP tables rules, uh, source NAT and a destination NAT. And we've seen that on a server. So it, it took like five or six emails before I could like get the guy to like finally find what, what was going on because I was saying y y your server is responding on that port. Uh, um, it, it's acting, it's an acting CNC server of a botnet. And it, it was, he had a very hard time because he was looking for processes with LSOF and so on. And finally, uh, he ran the IP table save, save command and he saw the actual uh, port that was redirected to uh, the tier two server. So if you want to capture the network, there's very good tools, TCP dump or T-Shark. Um, there was a good tutorial yesterday about uh, T-Shark and you can do all sorts of things with, with, uh, with T-Shark for the analysis if you want some somewhat automated way to do it. If, let's say you have a large packet capture and you want to uh, um, just get some bits out of it. Um, or if, if it's uh, not about automation, you can use Wireshark, which is GUI and you can click over the place. And another tool that we've been using that was quite useful is Bro. So Bro is um, um, so an, an IDS, but it, it actually like um, it, it's actually able to um, do TCP reassembly and get all the URLs out of the, uh, the the PCAP file easily. Not only URLs, but TCP connection, uh, um, strange behaviors also. And it's quite fast. You can put a 20 gigabytes PCAP to Bro, and it will process it. Now, if I want to speak more about malware and, and specific, how, what, how to deal with them, um, I've, I've made like two categories because they have different approach in, in terms of reverse engineering. Um, I, I call them uh, scripted malware for the, the ones that are um, in a scripted language like Python or Perl or so on. And all the, um, uh, the rest of the, the, the other categories is the compile malware where you have an ELF binary that's um, compiled for your architecture. So scripted malware, even though it, it, it's plain text, it can be quite obfuscated. So when we find it, most of the time, it's, uh, they remove all the white space, they, they have tools to rename the variables. Well, I hope they have tools to do it because it would take a very long time. And you can uh, have different layers of packing inside of them. So this is a Python script that I have no idea what it does just by looking at it. To help us uh, understand what it does, we have a lot of tools in our end. So if um, most of these scripting language have a, a TD um, a code TDer that can actually like do the indentation and and so on. So I'm, I've uh, named a few: uh, Perl TD for Perl, Python TD for Python, and PHP is quite hard to find because there's no TD in the name. It's PHP CS Fixer for Code Style Fixer. So this one is a, was a little bit harder to find. And then you can rename variables with search and replace. Fortunately, I don't have a better solution yet. Some of the values can also be packed or hidden in a way that it's, it's not human readable. So operations or uh, strings encoded in uh, exadecimal. Um, the code can also be packed. So for example, uh, um, 
let's say, Base64 and then AES, and then it's somehow decoded later. And again, they have tools to automate it, so sometimes you can hit some malware that has like 10 layers that you have to go over. But sometimes you can automate the, process, the reversing process as well. So. Um, so if you want to do it dynamically, for example, copy-pasting bits of codes and trying to uh, understand what it does. So it, it's very um, um, useful for unpacking. Let's say you know that this is eval and you want to know what's going through that eval function. Uh, there's a various uh, interactive prompt for all the languages. Um, I've given the example, the, um, um, the ones for Perl, Python, and PHP again. So uh, Perl is uh, Perl-DE1, and the IPython is, is uh, one of my favorite tools, even for uh, um, uh, not, uh, not only for, for reversing Python, but uh, to convert string backs and forth. Uh, and you can also use php.a for PHP. Oh, and you can, yeah, you can actually replace eval with print sometimes. So you know that there's this big block that does nothing except sending code to that eval, replace it with print, and you, you'll have the plain text. So the, the other category is uh, compile malware. So the, these ones are a bit more difficult to uh, go over uh, because they're compiled in the native uh, architecture of the system. Um, they can also use all sorts of obfuscation or uh, packing methods. Um, in order to attack them, to like try to figure out what it does, uh, of course, it, it takes a bit of um, under, uh, understanding the assembly language of the platform that you're uh, looking at. For example, if it's for servers, you're probably looking into uh, Intel 64-bit or 32-bit. Or if you're on router, the, you can um, you may have to understand MIPS or ARM to be able to understand really what it does. But there are a few tools that, that, that are very useful. The other, uh, again, strings. Uh, you can always uh, try this first and try to see if um, you can uh, figure out something fishy about the file. Um, there's also um, the Radar 2, which is a, a free um, Decompiler and um, it does all sorts of all sorts of uh, clever trick. It's got the debugger. It's 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 getting quite uh, good. So it's it's a quite recent project. They started a few years ago, and uh, it's getting better and better. Um, and there's also Ida Pro, which is very popular among reverse engineer, uh, but it's not a free tool. It's it's actually quite expensive. But it, it, it's quite good for what it does. So they have a decompiler and for 32 bits, 64 bits, and ARM as well. So if you want to do it dynamically, like launch it and watch the behavior, um, you can use strace to trace the different system calls. Um, there's also ltrace, and you can also launch it inside a debugger. So if you have a good uh, st static, static analysis, you want to know at this point what the value is, you can use GDB, break, and then um, um, let the, the process do, is, do the work. And as, as I said before, jCore also is, is uh, very interesting for uh, live processes. Now, if you are running malware, now, now today it's, it's an exercise, and these, these samples are binning, they're not malicious outside of the context of the sandbox, and you can do whatever you want with the sandbox. Uh, so you can debug it in, 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 in your containers, uh, I don't really care. 
Uh, but in, in a real life situation, um, we always suggest to run, run it in the, uh, an isolated environment. So without the network connection. So you can, um, you won't uh, connect with CNC servers or you might be giving a shell to the bad guys on your analysis machine, which is not a good idea. All right, well, that was my last, last slide. So there's a, a, a printable version if you want a PDF. You can print, click on the, 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 the small printer. <coughs> Did anyone find any of the flags yet? <laughs> 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 So, sorry? <laughs> All right, so if I, want, if I want to go through the whole thing, I, I better start now, because there's a lot of things to go over. <laughs> All right, so I have the same setup. I just click the, the button. I, I, I'm not cheating. I don't have a special VM or whatever. Um, all right, so. The font is so big. <laughs> is it still good if, if it's like that? Yeah, yeah okay. All right. So it, this uh, particular server, as I said before, is sending spam. I'm not sure if I talked about the, the scenario for the second one. The second one is about bandwidth. The second one is using too much bandwidth. But let's start with the first one. So I'm starting with listing the, the different processes that, that's on that machine. Um, at the moment, huh. The malware is not running, <laughs> which is not good. So there's supposed to be <laughs> I'm about to. I got a few back doors just in case. They... Well, did it work for any of you guys? Did, did anyone? Yeah, you found the flag, so it must have worked for, for some of you. Okay. What's that? I'm just gonna go a little bit faster. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. Uh, Huh. Hey, we've hit some kernel limits. We have too many people on the same machine. <laughs> All right, I'll try another machine. Yeah, probably like, so this one is, well, we'll see if it works. Ah, yeah. 
if you're curious about how the infrastructure of this whole thing works or does not work, like, like <laughs> in this case, um, I can talk about it later if you like. Bear with me for a few minutes. I will steal somebody's open VPN configuration in The load is good, but there's just too many files open. The, the machines will still be open, so I, I would need to destroy them, and that's not very fun. <laughs> it, 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 it brings down the fun for... Uh, I should have created myself one. So I don't, I don't know who is 02-0, zero -0, but... Yep. <clears throat> yeah, whatever. So I'm with, with somebody else on the machine. I was just trying to find out, to figure out who it was. Well, yeah, that's it. <laughs> All right. So this machine is indeed infected. I saw uh, the uh, the process I was looking for. So I'm starting off with listing the pro the different processes to see if there's something that looks suspicious. Um, so there's a few processes here. Um, the there's Apache. There's not that much um, on the real server. You would find like a lot more processes, so it, it's kind of a, a difficult to go through. But here um, we have only um, a Apache server and MySQL server. And there's one process here that looks suspicious. It, it's, um, it's called mail, but is launched by the, the same user as Apache. So I'll start off with this. So I'm going to keep the PID and list the different files that's open from that process.
Well, it's quite interesting to see that it's connected to some SMTP server, some Yahoo SMTP server. So it does send mail. Is it legitimate or not? I don't know yet. Another thing I could have done is uh, search for SMTP in LSOF-N-E and grep. And you get a lot of different connections to the to SMTP servers. Like, it, it sounds fishy. There's way too many. So let's see this, what this process is actually. Is it really a binary called mail or not? So I'll look into proc exe, and then, oh, it's not. Because the actual uh, binary that's being run is, is Perl. So that's, that's quite strange. And if we look at, for example, the uh, environment, Is it empty, really? It's empty for, for real, yeah. So there's nothing much here. So I don't have GDB installed. I'll, I'll install it. So I just, I just did a core dump of that process. I can uh, string and install. All right, so those are Perl scripts. Oh, we can see like small bits of email addresses, but not a full message yet. Oh, there's some IP here. That I'm, it's not the IP of that server, that's for sure. Oh, we can see that the current working directory of the, the process is actually inside the WordPress. So I should definitely look at the Apache logs to find out oops, if it's um, relevant. So definitely this process was launched by a some kind of PHP script or something. What else? Can we find a flag? <laughs> so here, um, I have a bit of source code, Perl source code here, and there is a flag right there. Um, it was right at the end of the full Perl script that, that's being run. We don't have the actual full, I don't think we can retrieve the full uh, Perl from the, um, the core dump, but I'll show you later how I did it. So. so we can see a little bit of the content of the spam and another flag in the content of the spam saying, well, this is nice spam. Uh, we've got URLs for that spam. So string is, is, is like a, 
a stupid tool, but it, it actually works uh, quite well on, on core dumps and So I'll go and s analyze the, the logs to see if I can find anything interesting. So let, let's look at the, from the, the last line. Oh, we see that we have a lot of requests to some ishuman plugin engine.php with a bunch of encoded stuff. So. What I'm going to do is try to copy and paste this. Oh, so somebody visited the page as well. All right, so I'm going to get the last line. So it's calling x to bin and then pass through, which uh, actu is actually executing code. Um, one of the nice bits here is uh, this is obviously PHP, and PHP has a feature where um, the, if you have a string literal that with, without the, the, the quotes that's not defined, it's actually going to transform it into a string. And so basically here, the, this uh, big exadecimal number is uh, transformed into a string which is sent to x to bin and passed through the system. So let's find out what it does. So x to bin is easy. I'm just going to use IPython to decode the hexadecimal code. Hmm, so we've got some binary here and, and some command that seems to be injected. So we've got another flag right here. So that's the third one. Um, let's see what it does. So we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. The, the, the first part we'll figure out later. The first one is PS, it's listing the process, and it's looking for a process um, that's named mail. And if it does not exist, it will use curl to download uh, something and pipe it into a, a shell. And finally, we'll print the, the flag. So the interesting part I here is the actual script that's being used to, so this is my, my actual machine. I, I don't have to be on the, uh, on the compromised machine to do this. So the content of the slash in is actually another script with another flag, so we have the fourth flag here. Um, so it's using this file for, and this URL, so again, downloading a URL and sending it to a file, and then a, uh, making the file executable, and finally launch it and delete it. It's strange because it's not exactly the behavior we had before because we, it was the, the Perl process. I don't think this is the, the Perl process. So let's get this favicon.eco. All right, so I'm assuming it's a, it's a elf, but it could have been a script because it, 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 it changed the, the flag to executable. So I'm just going to figure out what, what this file is. It's uh, indeed a 32-bit ELF binary. Free yes, it's a FreeBSD binary. And uh, I can, uh, it, it's interesting because it will run on both whatever BSD you have and uh, uh, Linux as well. And um, they do uh, very uh, um, smart trick to, to find out in which, what are, what are the, the syscalls, because their syscalls are not exactly the same, so they have to figure out if they're in a, in a BSD or a Linux system, and then if the syscalls are, are different, it will branch differently. So let's see if I can use my tool string here to find something. <clears throat> well, I'll just search for flag. Oh, and here we go. 
There's a fourth or fifth flag, I don't remember. Just at the end of the file, it seems. We need to find out what it does. So, yeah, this is a bunch of uh, gibberish. I'm not sure that I can make sense out of this, out of it yet. Um, I cannot run it in GDB on, in my machine. It's a West End machine. So I'm just going to download it here as well. <clears throat> but first, I will do some, uh, some other um, statistic analysis on it. So I will open the file in IDA. So sorry, I'm using the proprietary tool. Um, I could have used radar, I, uh, but I'm not good enough uh, with it yet to to uh, use it publicly. <laughs> but it, it, it's quite simple, so I think at radar it would have been good as well. So I was talking about the free BSD trick. So um, learning assembly language is a bit out of scope of the, the tutorial, of course, but. Uh, um, I'll, I'll give you some ints. Uh, so the int 80 here is a syscall. It will basically jump to the kernel and will, it will take um, on the variables on the stack to um, find out what the syscall is. So for example here, uh, it's using systime and then jumping depending on um, the return value of this syscall. The, the system is 13 on, in Linux, and on BSD, it, it's something else that fails. So uh, time will uh, return zero, and BSD will return, I think, minus one. And depending on the return value, it will set a value here, three for uh, BSD or Linux, and the other one, nine. So, and later, it will refer to that value here, so I can name it. Um, uh, OS type, and it will refer to that value to, to make the right syscall. So one of the interesting thing about this binary is that there's no import. There's just uh, an entry point, and we only have three function. It's quite small. It's pretty rare. Um, if we take a look at the overall layout here, We've got this bit of code and this bit that I don't have no idea, I have no clue what it is. And it seems to be printable. So see, if I try to make some string here, it's, uh, no, it's not all printable as, at all, actually. So there are some characters. So it seems to be encoded some, in some way. So we're just gonna follow what it does and identify the different syscall that it, that it does. So here we have, I'm just looking at the int 80 for the syscalls and looking at the value of AEX. So here we have a syscall, syswrite, syswrite again, oh, no. Uh, yeah, it's syswrite again. And there's some calls to function just before that. Ah, ECX is not an actual, it's, it's value 13, it's not a syscall, that's why. So it's calling this function with the value 13 in ECX and a buffer here that I can convert to a string, but it's not really readable. And let's see what this function does. Oh, yeah. Um, Ida is a quite good decompiler, so we can actually look at what, what the code looked like. And uh, we see that there uh, um, exclusive or operation here. And oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> ah, is that good or? Yeah. I can make it bigger. 
functions are quite small, so. <laughs> So yeah, it, it's taking the, bu the, the buffer and it's basically XORing some value on it. There's some, some kind of encryption algorithm. Uh, but I don't want really, I don't even need to really understand that because I can simply run it in a debugger and break at the right place and look at the value that, that's returned. So this is exactly what I'm gonna do. Oops. So we have here the value for the, the call. I'm, I, actually, I'm gonna break just after this, this call. So I'm gonna run this. So I don't really care about reinfecting my machine because it's a, it's a CTF. All right, so in GDB, you can break anywhere you want. You just give it the address where you wanna break and then run. And um, I'm located exactly at this point here uh, in the binary, so I can look here what the value is now. So this string is at this address, so what I'm gonna do is x string, and we have a first string that's in plain text. So this uh, decrypted string is actually for uh, user bin Perl. So let's see how it uses it later. We have a f the first bit of information. Now this, this encryption algorithm, I'm just gonna look if it's used elsewhere in the program because I know that I can decrypt it now. Uh, here. All right, it's this function. Oh, it's called here and 13, we can, we can guess that it's probably the size of the string. So this, this here, uh, here, this big blob is actually very big. So I'm gonna break just after this one. I'm gonna take the address. And continue. Now let's look at the value of this big thing. S again, hey, we've got Perl. So we just uh, successfully unpacked the, at least the first layer of, of encryption of this uh, particular malware. Um, now GDB um, doesn't print the whole thing. So what we can do is dump file, I think, and give it a range, dump memory. I'm just gonna do this, okay. <laughs> Start and stop, where stop is this plus the size. I think that works, we'll see. Uh, here, size. And start, stop, write a column the memory to a bar binary file, oh, file. So I'll dump it in uh, mal.pl. Okay, hopefully that worked. I hope it did. And we're gonna look at the mal.pl file. And it seems like we have the full content of the Perl script now. So we can see the, so this flag we, we, we saw it before because it was in the cordon, but it was actually at the very end of the Perl script uh, after a comment. So now we have um, something to work with to better understand how it works. I'm gonna use Perl TD to make it a little bit easier on the eye. 
Um, I don't think it's installed. So now I have a much more readable version of the Perl script. I'm just going to put it somewhere else. So there's a last bit here. So this is all the behavior. So it's communicating with, if we look at the, the, the main entry, the, the entry point. So here we, we also have um, the, um, the trick that's used to transform the, the, to rename the process to mail. So that's why you see the, the mail name in the, when you do PS. Um, you can basically replace zero, dollar um, zero, whatever you want. And it's not only valid for Perl, it, you can do it with whatever process. Again, it has some check, checks if it's running on Windows, FreeBSD, or Linux. And it has different behavior depending on the operating system. It's got a few, the variable here is called test, so it's probably testing if it's able to send spam before uh, anything else. And there's an init function call here before. And you see that here there's an exit. So the, thing, the interesting things are probably in the init function. So we have two function calls here. We have BDRP, only if, if um, it's not on, on Windows. And then there's a main called. And, uh, it's got this uh, join with an unpack uh, um, integer here. Uh, I'm not gonna do, do it. I could have done it with, oh, maybe I can do it here. Mm, I'm gonna miss a parenthesis. Ah. Uh, So uh, the exadecimal 2e is actually a dot, and it's actually the IP address of the CNC server that they tried to hide in the, in the, um, the Perl script. So we can see that it's the, the same address here, so it's, it's using also the, the, this address for something else. We, you, if you've done uh, TCP capture, uh, that's right, I, I haven't done TCP capture, but uh, you would have seen the, the response from the CNC server. You would have seen the spam being sent. Um, and by the way, I'm sinkholing the spam. Uh, don't worry, we're not sending thousands of uh, spam today. <laughs> I didn't receive uh, any emails from Amazon yet, so I think we're good. <laughs> um, so the main function probably uh, does all the, the payload with the uh, um, to uh, parse the response from the CNC servers and send the, the malicious spam. Um, I'm gonna go, there's, uh, so this is all like understandable, at, uh, at least a little bit. It's not very good Perl, by the way. I, I, I went through it and uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't fit the, they don't use a lot of good design pattern, let's say. Um, but there was this uh, BDRP thing, and there's a bunch of data here that I have no idea what it is. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is again run it in. So I cannot copy paste it. So what I'm going to do is open it in an editor. Sorry, I didn't uh, do like the, the uh, cooking shows where they have all, everything prepared before. I, uh, I decided that I wanted to do it all because, well. All right, so I have it in a text editor with highlight and everything. And this bit of code here is quite interesting. Because it, it, it's obviously trying to hide something. And it, it just calls unpack here. So I, I've, I'm not sure if I can copy paste it in the Perl interpreter, but I'll try. Whoops. Uh, So it's just calling unpack, so it seems safe. It's not like evaluating anything. Uh, no, that doesn't work. So I'm gonna create another file. Ew. I'm using some uh, OS X magic here, but I'm copying my pasteboard to Perl. Oh, so we've got the elf binary. We can see the signature at the beginning of the file. So it's not text. <clears throat> it's another binary. So I will just call it inner elf. Just make sure that it's a, in fact a elf, yes. And open this one, it's a static analyzer to realize that it's actually very similar that, than what we've seen before. So we can use the exact same technique to understand what's going on. So we know that this is probably the string Perl. Again, it looks the same, so it's probably even the same algorithm that's used. Um, and we have the decryption function here, so I can jump, I can break right here. This is a bit redundant, I'm sorry, but. Well, first of all, let's see what it does with this elf binary. I forgot. So it takes this binary, and then, it, yeah, it tells a lot. Um, it's looking for, what's that? Yep, correct, thank you. <laughs> um, it, it's checking for var temp and temp, and looking for uh, f um, any file that's uh, executable in there. Thank you, Perl, for being so clear. Um, and then it's, it's creating some random name, and it looks like a, a cron tab entry. Did anyone find that? So yeah, there was a, the, the, this, this malware was installing a, uh, oh, we can see it here actually, uh, being uh, installed. So it was installing another malware that's a backdoor inside vartem or temp. So here on the machine, we have this uh, 
the binary right here. If, if we look at the checksum of, of this file, it should match the one that we have decrypted. Oops. Yeah, so it's the same hash. So it was probably dropped by this uh, spamming thing. So I'm gonna have to go a little faster. I, we are running out of time, and I haven't started the second one yet. <laughs> um, so basically, when you unpack this one, you have another Perl script that's actually a backdoor with a different CNC server. And it, so the, the, the actual rule was to execute this file every 15 minutes. So at the hour, um, at the quarter, the half hour, and um, 45 minutes. And it was asking for a command uh, from the CNC server. Uh, if we run TCP dump, uh, we're gonna see it like in 10 minutes, which is not good. Oh, here, here's what I'm gonna do. So I'm gonna TCP dump and launch it. So in theory, we should see uh, the packet, the, the messages that's being sent. Um, so it's, it's inner, that pcap. I'll um, uh, copy it over. And open it with Wireshark. Which would, which would make our life a lot easier. Also, oh, we can see a bunch of DNS query to uh, SMTP server, so the backdoor is still running. I haven't cleaned the server yet, even though I found uh, the, uh, the script that installed it. I, uh, so basically, to clean the server, uh, I, the, the best way so far uh, is to uh, remove the, the backdoor that's, that's in the uh, PHP script. Uh, it was actually a, um, a vulnerability in one of the WordPress plugins. It was not something that was implanted there. It was the user who installed that plugin and never updated it. What's that? Ah, oh, yeah, I know. And uh, the, the, net, the internet is, is full of terrible things, including... Uh, uh, outdated WordPress and s suspicious plugins. <laughs> so I cannot see. So there's obviously spam being sent. And if you go over the spam, uh, you, we saw it in the cordon. So there, there, were, there were different ways to find the, the flags. But uh, you could have used a packet capture to find the, um, the flag in the messages. It's supposed to be over HTTP, but it, it, it queries a, a server and it, it look at the cookie, the set cookie header that the server will reply. It, it has some uh, um, encryption, so it decrypts it and it's basically a URL to download an additional binary. And this was the final stage for this uh, challenge. I didn't put any other binary there because it would have been endless. So, <laughs> so the, the, the final flag was in this, um, this command. Once you are able to decrypt it, you add, in place of the URL, you add a flag. And it was it, was it for the, uh, the first uh, challenge. So I have five minutes, so I'm just gonna go quickly over the other one, very quickly. Did anyone have, have time to look at it, or? Great.
So the scenario for the second one was that uh, um, it was sending to it, it was using too much bandwidth. So uh, if it's bandwidth, uh, let's look at the the network settings and let's do a packet capture to see what's going on. So I'm going to launch that in the background while I continue investigating. Uh, w. Just going to keep it short. Oops. All right, so I have a packet capture in the background, and I'm gonna look at the processes. I'm gonna use the same workflow that I used before. So here, we have a SSH session. We have an Nginx server. Um, in a SSH server, so it's it's pretty simple, but let's look at the different open ports. Oops. Ah. So we have a binary called N that's listening on this port. I have no idea what that is. Um, if we look at the, if we look back at the process list, we had this S bin N Nginx, pro, Nginx process. So it, it, it's quite strange because I don't even have Nginx installed on the machine. So if you look at the, <laughs> there was no like server install. So if you, we're going to look what this Nginx process is. I'm going to use core dump. There's one trick that I didn't talk about in my, uh, my slide, but the, the, that's quite interesting, is that you can uh, stop a process without uh, killing it. So you can stop the malicious behavior and still do analysis. Um, the signal is uh, sig stop, if I'm right. Uh, so you send that signal, and it, 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 it's, it's not a signal that's, that's catchable by the process. The, the kernel will stop that process, any b behavior, and you can later analyze it. So you can core dump after it. You can do whatever you want. It's actually what uh, uh, GDB used to stop the process, uh, take the memory, and then it, it just, uh, you can, I think uh, the signal to restart it is sig, sig cunt or continue. Sorry for my accent. <laughs> so yeah, the, 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 the PCAP file is getting bigger and bigger. So there is quite a lot of, well, it's not that much, but I, want, I wanted to, uh, the thing to, to still work. Um, so I'm gonna stop the, the packet capture for now. And core dump the Nginx process really fast. Uh, so I'm going to uh, take the master process. I could have taken the, the child one as well. They will all contain something different. And just string it. And because it's a CTF, we want to, oops, ah. So, as I said, because it's a CTF, we want to go fast and just find flags. That's flags, flags. Oh, there's an X flag header that's added. Uh, backend traffic, flag backend traffic was one of them. That's it. Uh, yeah, some of them don't because I, I, this one I couldn't. I said it. I said that most of them had, <laughs> but it's still a flag. Uh, you, you, you can see it. That the, so this, we cannot like uh, see the full configuration, but. 
So this is probably from a request or, or something. So if I want to go see the, where it's going to, I can use a PCAP or I can uh, see it in the uh, bits of uh, uh, strings there. Um, so I'm going to very rapidly open the So if I kill the process, it will actually come back. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's not so much process in there, and something somewhere is uh, reinstalling the, the thing. So yeah, the pickup tells a lot. So we have a request here from Um, 172, that, uh, 16. so it's a post, uh, user agent, fed fetcher, Google, feed fetcher, sorry. And there was a flag right there in the, in the query, posting stuff here, and there was also a flag that when, when you, uh, for the reply. So this one was uh, through the, uh, so it, it was some external guy communicating, and, um, We had two flags here, and there was also a flag in the response back. So the, you can see here that there's, no, there's not the X flag header that we've seen before. It was on the reply from the real backend, which is, I think, right there. All right. So. <clears throat> To make it short, uh, the uh, open SSH was backdoored. Uh, there was a backdoor, so if you grant strings on, on the SSH D binary, you will find a flag. Um, it, so there was some guy using that backdoor to, so the, 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 there was a backdoor password, um, and it was flag uh, num 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 something. And, yep, correct. Uh, yeah, I didn't have time to show, but was that? Ah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So uh, usually the the uh, the the real binaries will be stripped. So that, that that's that's a clue. And um, also, um, yeah, that that sum is a good way to find these kind of uh, backdoor. However, we have seen a uh, malicious guy uh, tempering the, the dead sums on the system, so it's not like a foolproof mechanism, unfortunately. Um, and the, so the, the, the last flag was if you reverse engineer this binary, you can find the CNC server where they steal the credentials for the, uh, so if you connect to that server over HTTP, you have the last flag. So that's it for uh, <laughs> the tutorial. Um, um, if you want, let me know if you want to have the uh, access to the server for a little bit more time. I will shut it down in, let's say, two hours. Uh, but if you want to uh, have access for, let's say, a week, I might be able to set up one of the server and give you access. I've got my card over there uh, if you want to contact me. And thank you very much for coming. I hope you had fun. And <laughs>